Father, this morning, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for how your people are mobilized when, when people need us. But I also want to thank you, Lord, for the selfless, selflessness that I've seen in the last couple of days of people wanting to be a part of the relief and help for this. And Father, it's not something to just write off. But at the same time, we've got to remember that this is going to be a long time situation. And Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to be a long term solution. Father, we do lift up these people that have been affected by this this morning. We know that some of them are still searching for their loved ones and have no idea where they may be. And Father, during moments like this, I pray that only your comfort, only your comfort, Lord, would surround these people because your comfort's the only one that's really going to help them. I pray for our rescue workers, our recovery workers, our linemen and our EMS workers and EMA workers because I know they're tired. And I know a lot of them are scratching their heads just trying to figure out where to start and how do we get this done. So, Father, I pray that you give them the wisdom that they need to move forward and that you would help them, Lord, with the strength and provision that they need to accomplish this task. Father, we ask that you be with all the people that are volunteering. I'm so thankful for the people who have given of their self to go up to these areas and go down to these areas and be a part of what's happening there. So, Father, I just pray that you would, God, continue to stir in people's hearts to move forward even in the days to come. The reality is, Lord, I've seen this too many times. I've seen it to where people are anxious to jump in when things, get, when things first hit. But I've also seen it where six, down, six weeks down the road where people completely forget the disaster even happened. Help us not to forget, Lord. Because the hard reality is, Lord, 100 miles to the west, and they could have been talking about us on the news. Help us to have empathy, Lord. Empathy for the people who are going through some difficult times. Help us to not be critical. Because, Lord, these people are making decisions based on what they need to do at the moment. And it's hard for them to see a week down the road when they can't even see the road that used to lead to their own home. Father, help us to be Jesus. Help us to show these people the love, the grace, the mercy that you have so richly shown us. Father, I pray that as we get into this word this morning, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear Eyes to see and a heart and mind to understand what it is that your word has for us this morning. But we also lift up River City, uh, Riverside Baptist Church to you as well, Lord. I lift up Brother Steve to you as he is presenting the word right now as we are as well. And I just pray that you would continue to bless this congregation as you have blessed us. Now, Father, help us to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So last week we started a new two-week series. Um, Y'all can thank my wife that I didn't try to give every bit of it to you in one le- one sermon. Uh, she's told me many times that I'll ask her how a sermon was, and she told me she's told me this once. She hasn't told me this often. She told me this once. She said that was two good sermons. So what I took that as meant is I was either too long or I tried to give in to give too much and that's why I broke this up because last week we talked about the deep issues of the heart we have a lot of deep issues that we hide in our heart some of them are good things some of them are great things some of them are our wedding day or the day that our children were born or the day that we graduated or big wins that we've accomplished in our life but there are other things that we hold in our heart that can cause us great pain great hurt and great destruction if we hold on to them too closely. Those things are simply our failures. Those things are simply our regrets. Those things are the unforgiveness that we hold in our heart. And last week I told you that anything that is deep in the recesses of our heart, at the bottom of our heart, that will be the foundation of the life that we live. 
And we don't want regret to be the foundation of our life. We don't want our failures to be the foundation of our life. We don't want unforgiveness to be the foundation of our life. We don't want these things to rule our life because if these things rule our life, we'll only have more regret, more failures, and more unforgiveness. And the psalmist, in verse 5, this is what he says. And I'm going to go ahead and read verse five, through, uh, 5. It won't be on the screen, but then I'm going to read 6 through 11 as well. But in verse 5, this is what he says. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? This is him searching down deep into his heart to find out what's going on inside of him. And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Then he goes on to say, O oh my God, my soul is in despair within, within me. Therefore, I remember you. Think about that for a minute. Why, and we talked about it a little bit last week, why is the psalmist having to remember God? Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and from the peaks of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sounds of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? As I, as, <clears throat> as the shattering of my bones... My adversaries revile me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you come, become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance, and my God. The psalmist is very clear about some things, and some things you've really got to dig into a little bit to see what he's talking about. The first thing that he talks about is he talks about remembering God, but he talks about remembering God in different locations. The first thing that he says is, remember God in the valleys of the Jordan. And you got to understand, whenever the psalmist was writing this, still not really sure who the psalmist was. Some say it was Korsh's son, but again, we're not really sure, but it is evident that he was somewhere present in Jerusalem when he wrote this. The Jordan, the valley of the Jordan River goes right by Jerusalem. So therefore, he was talking about a place that's close. The next place that he mentions, though, is he talks about Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon, you've got to understand, is over 150 miles away from Jerusalem. But Mount Hermon is a very distinct mountain in this area. Because he first acknowledges the valley, but then he talks about the highest point of the headwaters of the Jordan River. Mount Hermon is in a mountain range that is 150 no miles north, just like I said. That is what produces the Jordan River. But he also mentions this other one. And this other one is Mount Miser. And Mount Miser is actually a very little mountain. Matter of fact, most of us would call it a foothill. And actually, the word even means, miser means little mountain. So listen to what he's saying. He's saying, I remember you in the valley. I remember you on the highest mountain, and I remember you in the middle. Think about that for a minute. Because those are some places that we need to constantly remember God. Whenever we're in the valley of things that are going on in our life, the deep times in our life, we are quick to call out to God, aren't we? Whenever we need God's help, that's when we are fast to call out to Him. But I'll ask you a question. How quick are we to praise Him when the good things are happening or when we are on the mountaintop? 
Matter of fact, most of us don't even think about praising God for what he's done. I mean, honestly, how many of us even thought to praise him from sparing us from that storm? How many of us even woke up this morning and thought to praise him for this day that he has given us? Or how many of us even thought to wake up this morning and praise him for the opportunity to come and gather with his people? These things are so far from us at times, but we don't realize how important these things are. And we don't realize how important it is to constantly acknowledge him no matter where we are. But the place that I think is most dangerous is not on the top of the mountain and it's not in the valley. The place that I believe to be most dangerous is when we're on Mount Miser. Because Mount Miser is when everything is just going. You know what I mean? Everything is going good. Things aren't going bad. Things aren't going good. Everything is just going. And we get content with this. We like this area when everything is just going as it should. And I'm going to tell you something. While we very rarely cry out to God when things are going great, we hardly ever cry out to him when things are just going. In the middle is a dangerous area of our life. Because in the middle is where complacency sets in. We get used to things. We get used to things going the way they go every day. Every single one of us have a routine. Every single one of us get up, well, most of us. Um, some of you retired retire people, I'm, I'm jealous of you, but I'm not because you work more retired than you did when you worked. But regardless, most of us have a routine of what we do in the morning, of what we do with our day. And it's in these times of routine and regiment that this very dangerous thing creeps in to us thinking as long as our routine is not hindered by either good or bad, everything's okay. Brothers and sisters, everything's not okay. There is no in the middle. In the middle is a fictitious belief that we think we have. When everything is just going smooth and everything is going well. But here's the reality. When we're in the middle, there is absolutely no growth within us. You hear me say that? When we're in the middle, there is no growth within us. If you look back to all the growth that you've seen in your walk with Christ, most of it is either being in the valley, when God pulled you through some hard times, or on top of the mountain when he showed you how great he was. But no growth ever happens when things are just going along. This is one of the biggest problems in the church today. Because as long as our routines as long as our schedules, as long as what we consider to be good is not hindered, we think everything is going well in the church. But if, there are, if the church stays in the middle all the time and there is no spiritual growth, the only thing that we're believing is a lie that we are good. The middle, that middle ground, is the most dangerous place that we can be. And just like he says here, I will cry out to you, Lord, wherever I am. But there's another thing you've got to pull out of this. Because while he starts off close to Jerusalem with the Jordan Valley, he goes on to 150 miles away from Jerusalem, completely away from the center of everything that God has done, completely away from, from God's holy city. I'll ask you a question. How often do we cry out to God when we're far away from him? I mean, think about it. They say absence makes the heart grow fonder. But all of us grew up with friends we moved away, started doing our own life, or they moved away and started doing their own life. I want to ask you a question. 
When you're away from that individual, how often do you really think about them? I don't. It's kind of crazy that my best friends in high school, I don't know where half of them are. It's kind of crazy that the people that I grew up with in Blairsville, I couldn't find, FBI can't find them. I don't know. They got out of here. They didn't like it here for some reason. I love it. But since my heart has got away from them, since my presence has got away with them, I hardly ever think about them. And brothers and sisters, this is the same thing that happens to us when we get away from God. Yeah, but Scotty, I go to church. I'll tell you something. You can go to church and still be absent from God. Yeah, but Scotty, I've been serving people here, there, everywhere. You can serve people and still be absent from God. Yeah, but Scotty, you don't understand all the things that I've got going on. Yes, I do. Because even in my own ministry, I have had to check up on a weekly basis and realize that I've been doing everything right, as we say as a church. But when I look at how much time I've spent with God, I'm embarrassed to even call myself a pastor. Presence with God is something that we should desire every day. He started off the psalm saying, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. And you know, there's days that go by, and I don't think my soul pants for God. You know what I mean? There's days that go by that I lay my head down at night and I realize I haven't even prayed once. I know I'm a pastor. But I know you deal with it too. There's been days go by that I lay my head down at night and I think, I didn't even open the word. So we get the Bible out, we turn to the shortest verse, say, Jesus wept, and close it and say, we're good. I know, I've done it too. Even in doing life and having no problems, there's a big danger of being completely away from God. With the psalmist, it's completely different, guys. He's going through some hardships. Even in verse 9, he even said, and it, it kind of puzzles me how he says this. He says, I will say to God, my rock. He's acknowledging <coughs> who God is to him. He is the rock. He is the foundation of his life. But look what he says to God. Why have you forgot me? But here's the reality. God doesn't forget us. His word tells us that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. He has told us that he will be with us even until the end of the age. So what the psalmist is saying here is actually a reflection of his own self. It's not the fact that God has forgotten him. The reality is, remember, called reference there in verse six, verse 6. Therefore, I remember. The problem is, God didn't forget us. Our problem is, we're very quick to forget him. We're very quick to forget him. And that's the dangerous reality of our hearts. Because when we forget God, when we forget the salvation that he's given us, when we forget the grace, the mercy, and all the things that he's given us, that's when all these other issues start taking root in our life. And honestly, guys, that's why our lives look like such messes. God didn't forget us. The truth is, we forgot all about him. He goes on to say in verse 7, and this is one of those verses that I've read over and over and over again. And the depths of this verse, I mean, it talks about deeps, but the depths of this verse can go on for days and days and days. But I want to point out a couple of things to you in verse 6. Listen to what it says. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your, notice it's capitalized, your waterfalls. All your, notice it's capitalized, breakers, and all your, notice it's capitalized, waves have rolled over me. 
And, you know, we get to points in our life when so many bad things have happened to us that the only thing that we can think of is what's coming next. You know what I mean? Even this week, as we've been watching the weather, talking about all these other tropical storms coming up, it's just made me think, okay, God, what's next? War is starting to break out in the Middle East. All I can help but think is, God, what's next? And we just get crushed and crushed and crushed by all these things that are coming at us, whether it be on the news, social media, or wherever we're looking. And this is exactly what this psalmist is feeling. <coughs> he is feeling completely overwhelmed by what is taking place. These waves, these waterfalls, these breakers. But I want you to notice what he did. He gave those waterfalls and those breakers ownership. And who did he say owned them? He said God owned them. Just like the psalmist, there's a lot of times in our life that God gets blamed. That is it rightly his. What is being compared here is God, this psalmist is comparing these waterfalls, these breakers, and these waves to the punishment of God. Can you identify? I mean, honestly, let's get real. How many of you have ever said, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? How many of us have honestly said, God, why are you punishing me? How many of you have honestly said, God, why have you forsaken me? We've all been there. And a lot of times we give God credit for things that aren't actually his. Because what the psalmist is really dealing with here is he's dealing with the consequences of what he's allowed to be rooted in his heart. He's given God the credit for the depression that he is feeling. He's given God credit for the overwhelmingness. And brothers and sisters, there's some things that we got to understand here. One of those things that we've got to understand is that water that we're talking about here, water is a powerful thing. We saw the presence of the water in these floods. If you ever go into the Grand Canyon, you get to see what water can firsthand do. At its deepest part in the Grand Canyon, water has carved an area 6,000 feet deep. On average, the Grand Canyon is one mile deep. That's an amazing thing to be carved out by one little river, isn't it? Huge. But did you know that Georgia has its own Grand Canyon? Did y'all know that? There is a little town in South Georgia for, uh, for those uh, who used to go down to South Georgia with us to hunt in Randolph County, we used to drive by this every time we went down there. We didn't even know it. But it's in a little city called Lumpkin. Georgia has its own Grand Canyon just an hour south of Columbus in this little city called Grand Canyon. And do you know how this Grand Canyon was formed? This Grand Canyon was actually started forming in the 1800s. And the reason it was formed is because there were some people in that area who had some very, very poor farming practices. In other words, they wouldn't follow certain guidelines about terracing and trying to keep water erosion from taking place. And what has taken place in Georgia, in this little town of Lumpkin, is a Grand Canyon has formed because of people doing things poorly. But that's exactly what happens in our life. When we do things poorly, things in our life start to erode away. And we're left with nothing but the destruction. Nothing but the destruction. And this is where it all comes down to. Because bad decisions and bad actions result in one thing. You know what that is? bad consequences. Just like it's really not God's fault that this little Grand Canyon formed in Georgia, he allowed it to form, but it formed because of poor practices. A lot of our lives look like big 
voids and big holes simply because of the thing of our own bad decisions. It's not God's punishment on us. It's our consequences. <coughs> our consequences for the action that we've made. Our consequences for things that we've done. Our consequences for simply saying, I know what's best. And most of the time, God's judgment gets the blame for our consequences and actions. And you know what? Here's the thing. This is the thing that really gets me on this. Because until we acknowledge and own our consequences, we never truly understand God's forgiveness. And I know some of you are saying, now how's that, Scotty? Think about the day that you come to know Christ as Savior. What was the first thing that you had to acknowledge? My life's a wreck. My life is an absolute wreck. My decision to do life Scotty's way, that is what separated me from God. The devil didn't make me do it. It wasn't this little guy on my shoulder telling me to do things. It was all a result of the consequences that of my own actions. And until I understood that, I had no idea I really needed forgiveness. I had no idea that I needed grace. I had no idea that I needed mercy. And you know, here's the reality. We live in a day and time where we want to erase consequences. But when we erase the consequences of what we do, we lose the understanding of the forgiveness and grace that we have been given. Parents, we cannot allow our children to be spared from consequences. Consequences are our best teachers. Consequences help us learn what to do and not to do. And if you want to know why our world is in the shape that it's in, it's simply because of this. It's because there's no consequences for the actions of people, even when they're caught. And that is why our society is where it's at. That is why people don't understand the grace of God. That is why people don't understand the forgiveness of God. Because they don't think they've done nothing wrong. And the reality is this. There is it one person in this room who deserves heaven. Not even Pastor Jerry. You know what? I'll go even higher than that. Not even Sister Mary. Y'all forgive me. None of us. None of us deserve it. We all fall short of the glory of God. But until we owned our consequences, we didn't know how short we fell. You see, not only can our circumstances and our consequences be completely overwhelming, we've got to understand that God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness are just as overwhelming. Because you can look at this verse in two ways. He's looking at it from the consequence side. All these bad things that keep happening to him while these waves crashing on him. But I want us to look at it from a different side. Y'all remember that song? Here's my youth pastor days coming up. Um, waves of mercy, waves of grace. Y'all remember it? Everywhere I look, I see your face. Oh my gosh. Half y'all didn't grow up in church, did you? We got to change this sermon. Hope remembers it. I seen her. I can't even remember the name of the song. But why don't we look at the waves that are coming in at our, at our life as mercy, as grace, and as forgiveness? You see, there's a reason consequences happen. There is a reason that bad things happen in our life. Because if we were never woken to the reality of who we are, the wickedness that is inside of us, the depression that sits in our lives, if we were never awakened to this, do you know what? 
we would never need Jesus. And you know what? If we never needed Jesus, we would never have forgiveness. And most people come to know Christ in the hardest times of their life. Why? Because that's where we know we need him. That's where we know we need him. And that's why we got to be careful what we allow deep in here. Because those things that are deep in here, that regret, those failures, that unforgiveness, man, they can become overwhelming. But brothers and sisters, hear me on this. No matter how overwhelming those things are, None of them are as overwhelming as the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. None of them. Verse 7 and 11. Listen to what he says. Deep calls to deep, and the sounds break at your your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled me over. Listen to what it says in verse 8. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the nighttime. Ah, a prayer to the God of my life. Then jump on down. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, why are you in despair? This is where he's coming to a check in himself. Okay, I know there's a lot going on in here, but why are you in despair, oh my soul? Listen to what he says. And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. (coughs) The help of my countenance. Think about that for a minute. What's he's talking about here? He's talking about this. When I remember that God is my hope, the perspective that I have on life completely changes because I'm not living in despair. I'm not living in a moment to where I'm thinking about my regrets or thinking about my failures or thinking about all these things. When I'm living in a moment to where God is my help, the help for my accountants because he is my rock, life looks a lot better. You know why? Because no matter how hard and bad things get here, I know there's hope for something greater. And that's why Paul tells us. He tells us, we are destroying speculation and ever lofty thing raised up against us and the knowledge of God, with the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And what he's saying here is he's saying, you know, I'm not allowing all of these things to control my life anymore. And Paul had a lot to regret. Paul had a lot of failures in his life. But Paul was not willing to allow himself to be controlled or allow those things to be controlling. He took them captive. The reason he took them captive is because our mind, our heart is Satan's playground. And this is why our emotions are on a seesaw or a merry-go-round. And you know what, brothers and sisters? It's time that we take the playground back. It's time that we take the playground back. Because no longer am I his. There was a time that I was on his side. But because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and because of what he done for me, I have new ownership. So how should I? Or how can I allow these things to rule my life? He goes on to say in Philippians, he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is loving, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence in these things, in these things, dwell on these. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Dwell on these. And here's what he's saying. You're allowing the wrong things to rule your life. 
And you've already been set free from this. You've already been given deliverance from this. So why do you continue to live in it? You see, this is dealing with the deep. Because the deep no longer allows us to point a finger at anybody else for the faults of our life. Because when we deal with the deep, we have to realize where the blame really belongs. The only one who allows Satan to play on the playground of my mind is myself. The only one who gives Satan an inch of room in my heart is myself. So you know what that means about Satan? Satan only has as much power as I give him. But the sad thing is, is I'm owned by somebody else. And I'm letting Satan trespass in my life. Why are we doing it? Why are we giving him an inch? Why are we giving him a centimeter for my metric people? Why are we giving him a little crevice or a little corner in our heart to hang on to that despair, to hang on to that regret, to hang on to those failures? Do we not realize that we are a new creation in him? Do we not realize that he has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west? Do we not really truly believe that he has forgiven us? And the reality is this. It's hard for us to, it's hard for us to understand that he's forgiven us because most of us haven't even forgiven ourselves. Yeah, you've heard me say that. And you'll hear me say it again. The only one keeping you from embracing the freedom that Christ has given you is us. Let's pray. Father, you alone are good. You alone are holy. And you alone, God, are worthy of our praise. And Father, I come to you this morning first with a heart of repentance for allowing Satan to have any room in a heart that you've already bought. The reality is this, Lord. All the situations and circumstances of my life are my own fault. But the other side of the reality is that all of those have been forgiven by the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help me to deal with these deep issues. Because these deep issues become controlling. These deep issues become overwhelming. But Father, thank you for your word reminding us that these deep issues will never be as overwhelming as your love, your mercy, and your grace. So all these things I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey guys, Pastor Scotty Gerard here, and I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. We really hope that this has been a resource that's helped you grow in your purpose for God, but also grow in His glory. We also want to extend an invitation to you to join us here in person at Harmony Grove. We are located at 1008 Town Creek School Road in Blairsville, Georgia. We would love for you to come be a part of our service, to be a part of our small groups. If you have children, we have children's classes on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. And all this information can be found on our website. We'd also like to continue help you in your growth with Christ. If you have a question, maybe a prayer request, or just need to talk to somebody, you can contact us in the emails below in the description, or you can also contact us through our app and through our website, which are also found in the description below. Again, we hope this has been a blessing to you because we know that you joining us today has been a great blessing to us. Thank you so much. God bless.